Hi. So um, I'd like to finish off with the lectures for 1103 by talking about elasticity, stress, and strain. And just to be clear, when I say stress and strain, I mean the kind on materials and not the kind on students. Although this material might cause some stress and strain on students, but we won't talk about that today. Okay, so to talk about um, stress and strain, we first have to remind ourselves of Hooke's Law. Um, remember that Hooke's Law came from the force on springs. So the force on a spring is proportional to the strength of the spring, the spring constant K, and then how far the spring is stretched or compressed. And so here we're going to refer to that change in the length as delta L, and we're going to um, talk about materials and model them as springs. And to remind you, we don't really talk about springs so much in physics because springs themselves are so awesome although they are, it's just that um, there's such nice model systems for a lot of other phenomena and one of those examples is the uh, force on materials as they stretch or compress. So first I'd like to talk about the deformation of materials. There's two regimes. Um, the first one is elastic deformation. And when you have elastic deformation, what happens is you place a load or a weight um, on the material which stretches the material. And so the bonds in between the atoms in the material stretch a little bit, um, but they don't break or and the atoms don't move around too much. So when you unload the material, they just kind of go back to the way that they were. <clears throat> in that regime, the force on the material is linear um, with the, uh, the stretching of the material is linear with the applied load. So it acts like a spring and it's reversible. Okay, so you can apply that force and then let the force or load go and the material will go back to the way that it was. Um, but once you get into a certain amount of force, you stretch it even more and then uh, the material doesn't go back to the way that it was before. The bonds stretch, the atoms slide with respect to one another, and that changes the structure of the material, and that's called plastic um, deformation. And plastic deformation means basically permanent deformation. So you've, you've permanently deformed the material um, once you've stretched it past a certain point. We're going to deal with different kinds of forces. We call it a tensile force or a tensile stress um, when it's stretched in either direction, okay, away from the material, when the forces are applied away from the material. And you might see tensile stresses in things like cables, like in the ski lift, um, or anything supporting a load that's hanging down. So when you've got that, what we call it is stress and strain. So the stress is the force per unit area, cross-sectional area on the material. This, we do it this way because the change in the length of the stretch, stretched object doesn't just depend upon how hard you pull, but it also depends on how fat the material is, right? So if you're pulling on something that's kind of narrow like this pen, it'll stretch more than if you're pulling on a big fat beam or something, even if it's made out of the same material. Okay. Now, how the material responds, which is kind of like the spring constant, if you will, of your material, that's called the elastic or Young's modulus of the material. And it's been experimentally determined for a lot of different materials. And we say that the stress is proportional to the strain. And the strain is going to be a dimensionless quantity, which is the change in length, delta L, over its initial length, L naught. Okay? And so the way that we write that equation um, is usually we call stress the Greek letter sigma, and epsilon is the strain, which is delta L over L. So you have the stress is the force per unit area, which is equal to the elastic or Young's modulus, which we symbolize with an E, times the strain, which is the change in length over the initial length. Okay, so sigma is equal to E times epsilon. Now there's other kinds of stresses. It doesn't just have to be tensile stress, which is the stretching. It could also be compressive stretch, uh, compressive stress. So in other words, the columns in this picture are underneath uh, compressive stress. In other words, there's weight and they're being pushed on inward from either side. Um, and you also have shear stress, which is sort of a torsional stress. So you're, you're shearing it. In other words, the material the top and the bottom uh, of the material go in different directions, and that tends to deform the object as well. <clears throat>
So the elastic properties associated with the shear and then the compressive, which is we call the bulk, um, they have very similar relationships. So we call it the shear modulus, which is the shear force, or I'm sorry, the shear stress or shear force per unit area. We often call that tau. And then the elastic or shear modulus we call G. And then we set tau equal to G times gamma, which is the change in the length over the length of delta L over L for the shear. And then the elastic bolt modulus, that's more proportional to a pressure, right? So there you have a pressure which is equal to a force per unit area, which is equal to the bulk modulus times the change in volume in the material over the initial volume of the material. You might see bulk modulus um, referred to when you have to put something under a lot of pressure. So for example, submarines or anything that has to go deep under the water has to be able to withstand compression from all sides. Um, and you might see things with bulk modulus referred to in those cases. So here's some example values of elastic moduli for the tensile, which is the Young's modulus, the shear, which is the torsional force, or the bulk, which is the compressive force. So there's some example materials given in a table in your textbook that you can then use to work a lot of different problems. And it's interesting that these um, moduli are very large numbers uh, on the order of 10 to the ninth or a billion, billions of newtons per square meter that these materials can stand for a lot of common materials. So let me do an example problem for you. This is one from your textbook. Um, a steel wire 2 millimeters in diameter stretches by 0.03% when a mass is suspended from it. So how large is the mass? So first of all, let's remember that when you give a percentage, the percentage is equal to the fraction times 100%. So for example, uh, one half would be a fraction. The decimal number corresponding to one half would be 0.5, but that would correspond to 50% because you have to multiply it by 100%. So when we convert this um, percentage, 0.03%, then that's actually the fraction 0.0003. Now, that is going to be equal to the change in length over the initial length, so that will be equal to the strain. And now the stress, sigma, is equal to the force per unit area. The force is gravity, mg, and then the area would be the cross-sectional area of the wire, which would be a circle, okay? And the area of a circle is pi r squared. So you set sigma equal to the unknown mass, m, times 9.8 meters per second squared, which is g, divided by pi, divided by the radius of your wire, which is half the diameter, or 0 0.001 meters, and then you square that. And then you set that stress equal to the strain times the Young's modulus. If you look up the Young's modulus for steel, then that's 200 times 10 to the ninth newtons per meter squared. And then you multiply that times your strain, 0 0.0003. When you solve for the mass in that little equation there, um, then you get 19.2 kilograms. Okay? So uh, the steel wire uh, stretches by 2 millimeters when it's under um, uh, gravity caused by mass that's 19.2 kilograms. Now, of course, if you apply too much force um, and that increases your stress too much, then your object is going to break or fracture. Uh, the ultimate strengths of materials under tensile stress, compressional stress, and shear stress have been measured. Um, and they come from those curves that we saw a few slides back. So in particular, let me show you the um, curve again. Oh, I'll show it to you in a second. Um, so when you design a structure, it's actually a good idea to keep your anticipated stresses within a safety factor of about one-third to one-tenth of the ultimate strength of the material. And that's just because you need to be really super safe. So when you have a horizontal beam or any kind of material in a structure, um, the stress or strain, that, uh, the stress that it's under is going to be due to whatever it's supporting and also to its own weight. So you need to take that into account. Now, unfortunately, there's lots of examples throughout history of cases where people were killed or injured, um, badly injured, when materials or the design was poor and it failed um, due to construction or design problems. So, for example, your textbook gives an example of this walkway in a Kansas City hotel that collapsed one evening and killed more than 100 people. Um, but unfortunately, there's tons of examples of these throughout time. Now, if you look at the original design of the walkway, what happened was was 
they had it originally designed with one long support, okay, one long support. But when they started to do the construction, they decided that it was too hard to install one long support. And so they broke that into two shorter supports, which in the beginning wouldn't seem to be too big of a deal. But um, if you look at what the bolts that are um, holding those supports in, what weight they're supporting under shear stress, then it caused the, um, it, the stress was too much and it caused the bolts to shear off and fail. And so it's really important to be able to understand this kind of physics and engineering, uh, mainly because so many lives depend on it every single day. Now that ultimate strength of the material that comes from those stress strain curves. So what happens is you test a material. Um, we have one of these testers on the second floor of this building actually. And what happens is you stretch it out or you shear it or whatever kind of force you're interested in. And then you plot the stress that it's under versus the strain or how much it's stretching. Okay. And what will happen is it will be a straight curve for a while and that's the elastic regime. And then it will start to deform and the material will start to neck if it's under tensile stress or it will start to shear too much and you get plastic deformation. And then your curve will reach a maximum point. And then after that your material will really start to deform badly um, and it will start to fail and the curve will start to go down. And so the ultimate um, strength of the material is measured at the peak of the curve uh, right before it, the material starts to badly deform and you get that necking or small cracks and things like that in the material. So that's where the ultimate strength is measured from. So here's some uh, values that come in a table in your textbook for some of these strengths, these ultimate strengths in the materials. And they're given for the tensile, which is the stretching, the compressive strength, or the pushing, and then the shear strength, which is the, um, the torsion on the material. And the consequences of failure, as we discussed, are so disastrous that um, for most applications, engineers include a safety factor into their calculations of at least three, but sometimes ten or more, depending on how careful they'd like to be. And then what you do is you design it so that the actual stress shouldn't exceed one-tenth to one-third of the values given in this table. So to give an example of that, let me do another problem from your textbook. So an iron bolt is used to connect two iron plates together, and the bolt has to withstand shear forces of up to 3,200 newtons. So calculate the minimum diameter of the bolt based on a safety factor of 6. Okay, so if you look up um, in that table what the shear strength is for iron, then you get 170 times 10 to the 6th newtons per meter squared. Now that shear strength is equal to the force per unit area that it can withstand. And so the force uh, that we were given is 3200 newtons. But because we want to include that safety factor of 6, we would include that factor of 6. So we're going to pretend that that force is 6 times as large as 3200 newtons just to be safe. So 3200 times 6 is to, and then divide that by the area, cross-sectional area of your bolt, pi r squared, because your bolt, if you look at it, the cross-section is going to be a circle. Um, and then you solve for r. And r there would give you 0.56 centimeters or a diameter of 1.2 centimeters so that you know how large your bolts need to be. Now, in the history of architecture, um, the Romans, they developed the semicircular arch about 2,000 years ago. So, as opposed to just having supports and then a horizontal beam across, this was a great architectural advance. Part of the reason is that just from the materials that they had available at the time, basically the bricks that they could make or the rocks and stones that they could find, the materials just weren't large enough to span um, long structures. It's easy to find relatively small bricks and stones, right? But it's not so easy to find one that's six, seven, eight feet across. Okay, so just because of the size of the materials, the bu building an arch became necessary. But also, the material properties played into it. So stones and bricks, um, they're much stronger under compression than they are under shear. Uh, and so the arch was a design that enabled them to be supporting the weight by compression instead of shear, which is superior for those particular materials. Now, unfortunately, um, even the horizontal forces, uh, if you get large enough, are going to be very, very large. So you saw in the Middle Ages a new um, advance in architecture, not just the arch, but also the flying buttress. And so that enabled them to support even more 
weight from the outside of the structure, which enabled them to build those big, beautiful cathedrals that you see um, in the Gothic style. Now, they realized uh, relatively quickly, just by trial and error, that they could support more weight with a pointed arch than they could with a round arch. All right? Now, the reason for that is some of the statics that you learned in this chapter. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the torque that's coming out of an axis at the screen at you. Okay, so it's rotating as though it were on a table and you're twisting it this way and here were the arch. Okay, so you're going to calculate the torque about an axis coming out of the screen at you at the top of the arch. Here, that's these little black dots at the top of the arch. That would correspond to looking down on that axle that we're imagining to be there. And we're only going to consider half the arch. So the arches in these pictures are actually having to support about 120,000 newtons of force. But because we're only considering half the arch, we're going to take half that force. Okay? So let's look at the, um, the round arch first, which is here on the left. So your axis there is that black dot, and um, you've got three forces that are all perpendicular to the rotation axis, which is coming out of the screen at you. You have the weight of the arch itself, which would take place at the center of mass of the arch, which would be halfway between the middle here and the edge. So that's the weight. And that's that pink downward vector right there of 60,000 newtons. And then you have the normal force, which is um, acting at the bottom of the arch. Now this would be where the, the arch touches the ground, and then the ground pushes back. And that occurs um, at here at the edge with a force of the weight of half the arch, or 60,000 newtons. And now you're also going to have the horizontal compressive forces, which in this drawing are indicated with F sub H, and this pink arrow that points that way. All right, so calculating the torque for each one of those things, the angle is 90 degrees between each, and the lever arm from the uh, normal force would be 4 meters for this arch, which is 8 meters wide, and remember we're just considering half, so that's 4 meters. So 4 meters times 60,000 newtons. Um, now that's going to be a counterclockwise torque because the, uh, the normal force points upward, which would rotate counterclockwise. And now minus the clockwise torque um, due to the weight. So the weight would tend to rotate it clockwise, so we subtract that off. It acts at the center of mass, which is 2 meters from the arch, and then 60,000 newtons is the force. And now you want to solve for what the horizontal forces are. The horizontal forces are taking place at 4 meters away from that rotation axis, and we, we solve for that unknown F sub H. So that would be the equation for a round arch. Now, if you want to do instead a pointed arch, it would be a lot higher. In this example, it's an 8 meter high arch as opposed to a 4 meter high round arch. If they have to support the same weight of 120,000 newtons, and remember we're considering half that or 60,000 newtons, then the equation looks pretty much the same for the first two terms, except now that horizontal force is going to take place 8 meters away from the rotation axis instead of 4. And because it takes place at a larger distance from the rotation axis by a factor of 2, then that decreases the horizontal force by a factor of 2 as well. So for the pointed arch, the horizontal force is a factor of 2 less than for the higher um, arch, for the higher arch than for the uh, round arch. And of course, a lot of what I've been saying um, for arches, which is sort of a 2D type thing, would be the same physics, basically, for a dome. Okay, So if you have to span a space, sometimes um, in the old architectures they use domes, um, and it's a, it's a two-dimensional instead of a 1D problem Okay, for to span a 3D space. All right, so um, hopefully that helps you out with those last sections in the textbook, and I'll see you in class.